In the first couple of months of 2023, several sources have reported that the shortage of chips might be finally over. Alan Murray, the chief executive officer of a Fortune Media Corporation, even said that now we might have a surplus of chips. And this should worry the chip manufacturers that are investing billions of dollars in new plants in the USA or in Europe. We've also seen a crazy swing in supply and demand. Uh, we went through a year where everybody was talking about this intense shortage of semiconductors and you couldn't get the car you wanted because the automobile industry wasn't getting the semiconductors it needed. And now we're on the opposite side of that uh, where there is a glut of semiconductors. Too many and prices are dropping by enormous percentages. Regardless of the current inventory, the demand for chips will continue to grow and maximizing production is still a priority from the cost management point of view. Pat Gelsinger is the chief executive officer of Intel Corporation, and from the comments he made in a panel during the World Economic Forum, we can get an overview of where the industry is heading. Obviously, the semiconductor industry, a fixed cost, you know, long-term, heavy capital industry. If I run a factory full, it costs me X. If I run it empty, it costs me X, right? <laughs> so how do you run them? Full, right? And COVID created this enormous disruption. Literally, semiconductors were six years, right, of shortages in the industry. Inventories building, everybody's struggling to catch up. You know, how do I finally, you know, get to it? And then all of a sudden, the economy changes. None of us forecasted, except for maybe Larry Summers, right? You know, this decline in the industry. And all of a sudden, you get hit twice, yeah. right? First, declining demand, and then second, declining inventory position over a six-year cycle of building up. And all of a sudden now, you know, the industry turns. Now, semiconductor cyclicality is not unusual to the industry because of this long-term fixed cost nature of the industry. So we have ups and downs. Gordon but Moore you've used never joke, had ups and downs like yeah. that before. <laughs> uh, hey, you know, right? You know, it's, it's not, you know, if you look over the history of the industry, we've had pretty radical cycles, you know, before. Gordon Moore, one of our founders, right, Moore's Law, used to joke, we, had, we have supply-demand balance exactly Exactly two moments in time, once on the way up, once on the way down, <laughs> right? And we're on the way down. Now that said, you know, everybody, you know, still believes the semiconductor industry doubles this decade, yeah. right? And when you think about that, you know, you still need to make these long-term investments. And I, you know, said, I feel like I'm managing, right? I'm driving the car, hitting the brakes or driving the truck, sorry, Martin, <laughs> right? You know, hitting the brakes and hitting the gas at the same time yeah. because a three-quarter economic cycle cannot dictate a five-year capital cycle. Surplus of microprocessors, according to some sources, is for processors in consumer products, like computers, smartphones, small appliances, even toys. These are areas in which consumers are spending less due to the current economy. But scarcity remains for advanced microprocessors, like those used in cars, and for this market, the demand is constantly growing. Right? Even as we have overall gluts, there's still pieces of the industry that I'm still on allocation for the next year. Isn't it nuts? The, you know, the average car is going from 4 to 5% of the bill of materials as semiconductors. By the end of the decade, it's expected to be 20% because of EV and AV. You know, that's a 4 to 5x increase in the role of semiconductors. You thought the last couple of years were bad? If we don't fix this supply chain yeah. and this innovation partnership, how do you ever deliver EV, AV, IVI, you know, these key transformational yeah. aspects to the it's industry? One of the solutions to repair scarcity is to reduce the dependence of supply from Asian countries. These actions also has geopolitical implications. In 2014, China created a chip-focused investment fund to advance the production of microprocessors, and it is considered one of the top five fundamentals for economic development. Here are the implications for the Western world. You know, it took us three decades to have our supply chains move off of U.S. and EU. You know, we can all second-guess those policies now as we're looking back on it. But the fact that over three decades we allowed our industry to go from 80% U.S. and Europe to 80% in Asia and become precariously, you know, dependent on very few places in the world, right? You know, to me, that is the core issue that we're out to but, fix. But how, I, I have to ask you, I have and to ask it you. will take decades to fix. China, Korea, Taiwan, you know, Japan, you know, they have been driving their industrial policy in this area. That's why the industry has moved. 
right? Right to Asia. You know, we're now seven, I think it's seven five-year plans that China's put in place that have prioritized this industry. Sort of obvious. Right. So, I mean, this is a long, you know, investment cycle on their part. You know, they are the largest, you know, manu you know manufacturer now uh, outside of Taiwan, right, is China, right? And, you know, they process most of the equipment through China. This has become a huge piece, right? And, you know, there is nothing like disengagement ever possible in the economy because they play a huge role. But at the same time, we're also saying, what is the geographically balanced supply chain need to look like for the world? Europe should be able to say, I can meet my critical industry requirements. So should the Americas. That's what we're out to do is not, you know, not separation, right? Not disengagement, but a balanced, resilient supply chain. And that to me is the singular word we should all be focused on. If I could rename WEF this year, it'd be resilience. In several occasions when talking about supply chain, Elon Musk has mentioned how the whole production at the Gigafactory in Nevada came to a stop simply because they did not have the USB cables used to plug in a phone in the car. A similar situation happened at Ford when the company was forced to cut down 40,000 F-150 pickup trucks from the production target simply because they could not get enough of the components that go in the windshield wiper motors of the truck. Tesla and Ford are not the only companies to have these problems, and Intel is determined to provide the solution. You know, the fact that for, you know, literally for $2 components we're stopping billion dollar projects, how untenable Crazy. that is for the global Crazy. economy. Because a lot of what happened in the automotive industry, but also some of the other industrial industries, you know, they're tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers. They didn't even know what chips were in there. Mm. And all of a sudden, it's sort of like, what do you mean mm. we don't have semiconductor supply? But they didn't even have visibility through the supply chain because it had been sedimented, right, you know, through these uh, sub suppliers as well. And that's where, you know, the intimacy of understanding the criticality of supply. I believe, you know, government need to do that and supply chains but also right customers need to do it right you know because you know if you don't know where those core technologies are how do you actually form policies to manage them one way to do this is to visualize the supply chain to the smallest link and this is also a requirement that is included in the chips act this was the law introduced in 2022 and provides about $200 billion in new funding to boost domestic research and manufacturers of semiconductors in the United States. One of the main requirements of the Act is transparency, which is welcomed by the Intel CEO as it forces all the parties involved to be aware of what goes on into a car, for example. You might recall the first thing that Commerce did right, in the, the chip tax was in fact supply chain transparency. Yeah. Right, where they, you know, started to put policies in place to start getting those things available, right? You know, so that people could start looking at it. I'd also say this to me is a little bit where fair market, you know, free market kind of behavior, you know, distribution channels are generally pretty efficient, right? At that uh, at that level, and you know, you know, it's an area where hey, a little bit of transparency. But the other factor is, and this is where I see a lot of this going in the future, is we're moving from chips to chiplets and composites where we need to drive more standardization, exactly. okay. right? And the standardization of how the things are put together, how we can go from, you know, thousands of chips to hundreds of chips, right, you know, that have standardized interfaces in it, more interplay between the different components. You know, I expect there'll be some meaningful announcements in this area specifically for the auto industry this year. The visualization of the supply chain is not just limited to the transportation of a component from A to B, but it goes all the way down to the acquisition of minerals. You know, the minerals are not the issue in most cases. It's actually the refining of the minerals, right, and where that is. It's actually moved, it's fairly easy to move the minerals, the refineries, right, and obviously U.S. are regulatories around environmental and so on. Hey, maybe we're not going to fix it. It's the fixing the supply chains that come into it, right, you know, and as we look at where semiconductors are built now, hey, you know, it's also the packaging assembly test. It's also then the systems and the, you know, uh, you know sheet metal bending that goes in and where the power supply built, the displays, the LCDs, and so on, uh, has to be across the supply chain. And my advice to government is make sure we're looking across the supply chain and fixing one by one every one of the critical factors that give you the assurance of supply that you need for your critical industries over the long term. No, and not just at one not point. Not just one thing. And supply chain and demand are not the only issues facing chip manufacturers. New technologies also affect the way chips are designed and plants need to be planned for new generations of chips. Once again, Tesla is leading the race in this field. In 
2021. In fact, Tesla introduced a new design for chips based on 3D to accommodate the massive amount of data generated by AI and by autonomous driving. The new design has an impact that goes beyond Tesla cars. Chips in 3D that's making a new history for AI and autonomous driving. Why do companies want to build 3D chips? Well, they're typically one of the two reasons. One reason is to collect chiplets coming from optimal processes so that when they're combined together, you get the best functionality at the system level. That's the system of chiplets or integration. The other reason is to break down a larger chip into smaller pieces so you accomplish higher yield. That gives you lower cost. So greater performance, power, and lower cost. In some cases, either, either integration or disaggregation will give you a faster time to market as compared to a monolithic chip. And if it's done correctly, you can actually get better security. Is, and this is where I see a lot of this going in the future, is we're moving from chips to chiplets and composites where we need to drive more standardization, exactly. okay. right? And the standardization of how the things are put together, how we can go from, you know, thousands of chips to hundreds of chips, right, you know, that have standardized interfaces in it, more interplay between the different components. You know, I expect there'll be some meaningful announcements in this area specifically for the auto industry this year. Mm. Right, in some cases it's easier to redesign the chip to a more modern node than it is to build a four-year factory investment to build a process technology that is already 20 years old, right? The economics of making new capital investments in very old nodes, right, is a very difficult thing. So we've worked with a lot of customers to help them accelerate move to more modern nodes, right? And by the way, as, as you do that, it actually frees up more of the old capacity for some of those chips that are much harder to move uh, as well. But this is where I say deep conversations with the customers in the supply chain. And, you know, we're putting now in place, you know, multi-decade supply agreements with our customers, right? Saying, how do we take care of you for decades to come? Because this is such a harrowing experience. Yeah. And here is a final overview of the industry. The world is moving more digital, right? You know, every aspect of human existence becoming more uh, digital. You know, I call it the five superpowers. Everything's becoming connected. Everything is becoming a computer, right? We have infrastructure between cloud and edge that allows, you know, uh, you know essentially everybody can own a supercomputer now in a few seconds, right? You know, you have AI, right, which is making sense of all this data. And finally, we're able to sense everything as well. Right, you know, see here all of our you know, digital devices. So literally, these superpowers are transforming. The, the the famous statement: democracy does the right thing always after it's exhausted all other possibilities. <laughs> right. And you know, here we needed a global crisis to realize that we had allowed ourselves to become acutely dependent on single points of failure in the supply chain, on critical aspects that's underlying all aspects of humanity. You know, the simple word is, you know, we need resilient supply chains for the future without single points of failure. You know, that's what we need to be building, and that's the core lesson that we need to have taken through, right, this economic, technological supply chain shock that we've gone through.